Hello, good evening, and a very warm welcome to you this evening. Thank you for joining us. Uh, wherever you're listening from, uh, it's great to have you with us. And uh, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to, to Jeremy Marshall, who's uh, joined us all the way from Seven Oaks. Hello, Jeremy. You're on mute at the moment, Jeremy, but uh, whenever I need you, I'm sure you'll, you'll unmute. Um, I've, I've a confession to make. I have a great, um, a great weakness in starting books but not finishing them. I wonder, uh, Jeremy's got quite a few behind him there. I wonder if you've got through all of them. Um, but uh, I, I, I'm, I'm good at starting them, not finishing them. But Jeremy, I, I have uh, re received both of yours and read both of them. Um, and uh, thank you. They've been really helpful for me. Um, and I trust they will be for others. And we'll be hearing more about some of, the, some of what's in these books uh, this evening. I made one or two connections with you through these through these. You, you mentioned that you were uh, a, a bit of a, a smuggler growing up. Um, people around here used to smuggle butter and eggs over the border, but you were smuggling something else as a, as a young lad. Can you, can you just tell us about that? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, my father, who was a bit of a character, every summer, this was in the early 1970s and until the 90, early 1980s, he used to take us Bible smuggling behind the Iron Curtain. So he'd load up his old car and uh, he'd put in Russian or um, Romanian or Polish or whatever the uh, language was in the country he was going, and off and off we'd go. And uh, Dad also believed in never telling lies. So when we get to say the Soviet border, they would say, uh, "Have you got any Russian Bibles?" And Dad would say, "Yes." And under the Soviet Constitution, I'm allowed to bring them in for personal consumption. And then they'd have a big <laughs> argument, and he'd kind of haggle with them basically. So they'd say. Well, how many have you got? And he'd say 50. And they'd say, well, that's too many. So he'd say, well, how many can I bring in? So um, what we used to do was then to rock up at these uh, churches in the USSR or anywhere behind the Iron Curtain. And the people were rather surprised to see my father and us, not least because my father had taught himself Russian using lingua phone from the local library. <laughs> so his Russian was a bit rocky. But um, the thing that struck me, um, Nick, was why on earth were these people uh, Christian? Because they had every possible reason not to believe. You know, the Soviet Union and the other countries were atheistic states. They didn't mind if you're an old granny, a babushka of 80 or something. But if you're a young person, especially if you're a teenager, then they would make sure if you, if, if you went to church that you didn't have a job and go to university, you couldn't have somewhere to live. And yet what struck me about these people was their incredible, vibrant faith. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. And um, Jeremy, you cut out a bit for me there. And that reminds me, I meant to say to everyone else, if I cut out, that's my rural broadband. We're promised to have fiber here soon, but it's not arrived yet. That's why I'm here in the church. I get better signal here. Um, but if I cut out, Jeremy will carry on and he'll interview himself and I'll pop back in at some point. Um, but the other thing I, I, I made the connection with you, Jeremy, is you're from uh, the second best place uh, in the world or you live in the second best place in the world after, after County Cavern, of course, um, is Kent, the Garden of England. And you're in, in Seven Oaks there. Uh, that's where I grew up. And when I used to tell people I was from Seven Oaks, they'd, they'd always mention the hurricane and you'd get some joke about that. Do you, do you still get that today? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because Seven Oaks, strangely enough, was named after seven mighty oaks. But in the great storm of 87, six of them blew down. So they planted yes. uh, seven saplings and now we have eight oaks. So we should really change the name. <laughs> um. Uh, yes, that that was always the, the the joke when I was there as well. And and um, why did we replant seven? But there we are. Uh, how how is how is Seven Oaks now? How how's lockdown been for you? How how are your family? How it, it's been a, it's been a hard year for everyone, and I imagine it has for you as well. Can you just tell us about your your life in Seven Oaks and lockdown? Sure. So I'm married to Jeanette. We've got three uh, adult children. We've got a daughter who's married. Looks like we've lost Nick, so I'll carry on interviewing myself uh, in Cambridge. And then two boys, one in London, one in Manchester. And um, I've been shielding for the last year. But in a strange way, it's kind of not been a, such a big change for me because for the last, uh, as you're going to hear in a minute, for the last six years, um, 
uh, I, I've got a kind of weak immune system because of my illness. So every time I was on the train and somebody coughed or sneezed, I felt afraid. So what I like to say in a friendly way is welcome to my world. And um, I've had to shield and be on my own for that period. I've also been in hospital, actually, Nick, um, in the middle of lockdown. I had a I had basically I thought I was having a heart attack. So I went into hospital and they ran all kinds of tests and they stuck me in a in a solitary room for about a week, which was which was pretty hard. Um, I'm kind of used to being in hospital, but not not on my own. And um, they still didn't really find out to this day what the matter is. It probably related to COVID. That's what they that's what they thought. So it's been a really hard last year. Yes. Yeah. And, and you, you may have said and I may have missed family as well living with you and some family grown up is that right yeah, that's right nick as i as, as i mentioned while you were away yeah we've got three uh, three adult children uh two boys and a, and a daughter yeah and before um before i got ill i, I used to work i'm afraid in all things as, uh, as as a banker right so i know some of you will probably be throwing things at the screen at this point so um <laughs> I grew up in Hertfordshire, and then after university, I went into banking. And um, the main uh, kind of bank, yeah, go ahead, Nick. I was just going to say, what well, what was that like? And and um, you know, how how much money do you need to be to be happy? What's what's the answer, Jeremy? <laughs> well, I did spend most of my time in banking, dealing with what's called private banking, which is a sort of saying for people with lots and lots of money. So what I did in my career was help very wealthy people get even wealthier, which some of you might think is not the most honorable profession. But one thing I found there was that uh, having a lot of money doesn't make you happy. And uh, my last job before uh, before I got ill, I was chief executive of a very old family owned bank, um, 350 years old, still owned by the same family called Seahor and Co. And it was kind of my dream job, really. Um, Nick, a beautiful building in, in central London, from, dating from 1690. And um, both there and before, when I worked all over the world in private banking, I dealt with many you know, extremely wealthy people. Um, the actor Jim Carey says, I wish everyone could have their dreams come true so that they could see that having their dreams come true doesn't make them happy. And that, I would say, was my experience from dealing with very wealthy people. Often very wealthy people, I'm talking here of self-made people, are very driven. And whatever they have, they're always looking for something else. They, if you make 50 million, they want 100. If you've got 100, you want 200 and so on. I guess you would say they're restless. And um, I think that's a characteristic of many very successful people. They're driven. They're looking for something, but they can't find it. Yes. Always wanting a little bit more. Um uh, and and then one day your life changed. Um, what what happened? Sure. So about um, eight years ago, one day in the shower, I found a, a very small, like a tiny pea lump on my rib. And um, I went to the GP who said, oh, it's just a fatty lump. It's nothing to worry about. Um, but we'll get it checked out in a way. Now, maybe some of you watching have been through this because this is the typical way that cancer starts. You get passed from specialist to specialist, and each person says, I don't know what that is, but we need to check it out. And eventually I ended up at the Marsden, which only does one thing, which is cancer. So they told me this was after about four or five months. You've got this really rare type of cancer. It's a type of sarcoma. Sarcoma is a cancer of the muscle tissue. Um, but we caught it early and we should be able to deal with it. And I went through about six months of treatment and then everything went back to normal and the cancer was gone. And uh, for about two years, life resumed. Certainly in Seven Oaks and maybe where you are in Drumnick, sometimes on country roads, you can be driving a bit too fast and you see a car coming the other way and you think, oh, crumbs, that was a bit close. But as my mother likes to say, a miss is as good as a mile, right? So you think, oh, never mind. But then something else happened uh, nearly six years ago. I was at a friend's house here in Seven Oaks having a meal and I went to adjust my collar. And as I did that, I felt a massive lump on my collarbone, not like a pea, but like a golf ball this time. And within a few seconds, my life changed forever because I knew straight away what it was. And I said to my wife, look, I'm sorry, we need to go home. And um, I went back to the hospital for checkups. And then a few days later, um, I was sitting in the waiting room with my wife, <coughs> excuse me, 
and uh, the nurse said please come through and we walked down a little corridor and she said um, on the way the nurse said I'm really sorry and that was the only warning I had because when I got into the room there were all these doctors there and they said look uh, we're sorry we don't know how we missed it um, about a year later they decided it was a completely unrelated but also very rare type of cancer a different cancer so that's why they were screening in the wrong place if you like yes. and unlike the first time they said uh, look you know you've got tumors everywhere there's not a great deal we can do we can't some of them are inoperable we can't cure you so of course the next question you ask is well how long do you think i've got and um they said well you know you can never exactly tell which of course was right because i'm still alive right but um they said 18 months mm. so at that i burst into tears and uh, please if you're watching this don't think i'm some kind of cancer expert or religious person i'm a banker right the least religious type of people there are and it's been really hard uh, the last uh, six years in two ways i would say uh, nick Firstly, obviously, all the kind of treatment you go through. So I've had about 30 chemotherapies, had about a dozen operations. I, I lost the sight in both eyes, one after the other. It was truly terrifying to suddenly go blind, maybe related to the treatment. But I, I got it back in one eye. And um, then, as I mentioned, last year I had this you know, serious heart issue. So I feel I've done oncology, I've done ophthalmology, and now I'm on to cardiology, right? Um, but the harder thing than that is yeah. um, is the impact it has on your family. So to have to go home from the hospital yes. and then go and tell our children who are mainly at university um, what I've just told you was really hard. It was hard you know, to tell my sisters and to tell my mother. My mother even said, um, I wish it was me. She's now nearly 90. And, you know, that's really touching. The more someone loves you the more when you've got a terrible cancer diagnosis, the more the more it impacts them. I, 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 I lost you a little bit there, Jeremy. Having, having read your books, I, I think... Okay, well, we lost Nick. I know the question he was going to ask me next, which was, how, how do you feel? What does it feel like to have cancer? So... I would say the biggest emotion I've, I've experienced in the last six years is fear, fear, fear of dying. Um, I've had loved ones, I've had my own father, I've had other people in hospices or in hospitals dying of cancer, and it's a pretty horrible experience. And please, I, I want to be honest with you, I'm, I'm afraid of I'm afraid of dying. But um, the thing that's kept me going through that has been has been Jesus Christ. And by that, please don't think it's some kind of mystical experience. Again, as I keep saying, I'm, I'm not a religious person, I'm, I'm a banker. And um, what do I mean by that then is, well, I remember the promises that Jesus makes to those who trust in him. Jesus' last words to his disciples were this, look, I'm with you always, even to the very end of the age. Or perhaps the most famous chapter in the Bible is the 23rd Psalm. And in it, we read this, yes, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. That's, friends, been my experience in the last six years. You see, God doesn't promise us a bypass around the valley of the shadow of death. As you know, Nick, there is a bypass around Seven Oaks, but there's no bypass around death. And being a Christian isn't a kind of get out of jail free card where we can say, I don't have to die. But what God promises us if we trust in him is something much more amazing than a bypass. It's his presence. It's his presence, and that makes all the difference to me. It yes. also makes a difference because it gives me hope. I mean, humanly speaking, I haven't got hope. Like the doctors tell me they can't, they can't cure me. But hope, hope is amazing, and it makes all the difference. And the Christian hope is not like the hope we might have in other things. As you know, Nick, I'm a keen Watford fan. Some of you might think I have enough suffering in my life without adding to it. Anyway, I'm <laughs> very hopeful that we're going to get promoted back to the Premier League. But we may not, right? But the Christian hope is something we can rely on, something sure, something that means there is an answer to death. And friends, that's something we've all had to think about, isn't it, in the last in the last year? I mean, I've had to think about my mortality and I may die soon in the last six years, eight years. But now we all have to think about it. That's been the terrible effect of the last year. And what's made the difference to me yes. has been Jesus Christ. Yes.
There was a, a very helpful bit in, in one of your books, um, Jeremy, where you, you talk about that sense of the Lord Jesus walking with you as you were in that hospital bed uh, being along, uh, alongside you. Can I just rewind a little bit, though, and, and I may have missed some of this, so apologies if I, if I did, <laughs> but um, the, 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 big, the big question is, is, is um, if there is a loving God, why does he allow the coronavirus? Why does he allow the cancer? Why doesn't he do something about it? It's great to know that he's with you in it, but why, why doesn't he do something about it? Nick, that's the most common question that people ask me, and it's the most common question that people ask Christians in general. If there is a loving God, why doesn't he do something about it? So here's my answer. Number one, Christians believe in the eternal greater God who made the whole universe. And how did God make the universe? He made it good. He made it good. Something's gone wrong, right? Because if we look at the world, there is good in it, but there's also evil. I mean, here in London, for example, people have been really affected by this terrible murder by a policeman, of all people, of this poor woman on Clapham Common. And they're rightly, you know, angry about that. that there's evil in the world. There's natural evil as well. Cancer, coronavirus, all sorts of terrible things that happen. But if we're honest, when we look in the mirror, there's also evil. A man called Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the Russian writer, said this, the line between good and evil doesn't run between countries. It doesn't run between political parties. It doesn't even run between people. It runs right down the middle of each one of us. And the Bible says that each one of us have done things that are wrong, that have alienated us from God, what the Bible calls sin. And each one of us, by nature, has said to God, to hell with you. I don't want you in my life. I want to do it my way. So given the mess we're in, why doesn't God do something about it? Right? That's the question again. Well, the Christian claim, which we're about to particularly remember tomorrow, is that God did do something about it 2,000 years ago. And that the eternal creator God who made the whole universe became a human being. Christians believe that Jesus is 100% God and 100% human. And that this man did things that nobody had ever done before or since. For example, going to a graveyard and calling people out from the dead, right? Yeah, I don't know if you've got a graveyard there in Drum, Nick, but if you want to draw a cloud, a crowd, announce in the mm -hmm. local uh, media that you're going to be raising people from the dead in the churchyard, you'll certainly draw a crowd then. But more than that, yeah. Jesus himself experienced suffering. And that, that, that's a very, very powerful thing for me. The Bible tells us of Jesus being in a garden, which we'll remember tomorrow night or tonight, actually, I guess, isn't it? Um, and um, mm. that he was he was overcome with sorrow. And he said, Father, if it's your will, take this cup away from me. But let not my will, but your will be done. And by the cup, Jesus meant the cup of sorrow, the cup of suffering, the cup of evil, the cup of death. And yet he willingly went to the cross. Why? Well, why did Jesus do that? Well, two reasons, I suggest. One, if you like, there's a, there's a canyon, there's a grand canyon of, of, of evil separating us from God, and we can't get back to God. By the way, we need to get back to God because that's the only place we'll find what we need, what we're designed for. And God throws down a bridge, and God throws down a bridge that we can cross back to him, and that bridge is, is, is his son and the death of his son. Because Christians believe on the cross, Jesus paid the bill for all the things that we've done wrong and made it possible for us to get back to God. He offers us forgiveness. And secondly, what motivated Jesus to do that? Why, why did he go through that when he knew what was going to happen? He knew he was going to die a terrible death. Love, friends, love. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that God loved us. God loved us when we were his enemies, when we were far from him, when we rejected him, when we were going away from him. He sent his son into the world to die for us. A man called Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German pastor who stood up against the persecution of the Jews and was executed at the end of the Second World War. And just before that, he smuggled out of his jail a little piece of paper. And on it, he wrote this, only a suffering God can help us. Only a suffering God can help us. So what's the Christian God like? He's a suffering God. And how can he suffer if he's God? Because he became a human being. And what does that suffering mean? Which is what we remember tomorrow on Good Friday. 
that there's a way back to the Father. And that's amazing. And that means that God do something about it. And God doesn't want anyone, if you like, to remain on the other side, alienated and, and away from him. He invites all to cross that bridge, the bridge of the cross, back to him. That, that is wonderful, Jeremy, and I, I did. I caught most of most of that. Um, but but from from what you're saying, you're saying that there's there's a way back to God. Uh, there's a way to right relationship with God. There's a way uh, to be friends with God forever, to enjoy eternal life. Now, some might say, and I've had it said to me, that's just wishful thinking, isn't it? I mean, given your your prognosis, isn't it just wishful thinking that something to get you through life, to get you through this suffering, it's good to be hopeful and, and maybe, you know, maybe it helps you, Jeremy, and that's fine, but it, it's not true. Um, what would you say to that? Yeah, I gather, Nick, that in, in, in your area, there's a saying also, when you're dead, you're dead, right? So that's a... That's the kind of opposite view, right? So I think there are two views, two views about life, two broad views. There may be others. Please ask me if, if, if your view is not in this. But one view is if you're dead, you're dead. And um, that view is, is ably developed by the person who, in my view, has been the best friend of the Christian church for the last 30 years, at least in England, who's Professor Richard Dawkins of Oxford University. And the reason I love Dawkins is because he's so honest. And at least it maybe it's different in Ireland, but in England, people don't like to talk about death. We don't like to think about death, which is why the last year has been strange. When you go to a funeral, people talk about the person being in the next room, right? It's sort of euphemisms and we're not really thinking about it. We actually don't really want to think about it because there's no answer. But Dawkins will have none of that. Dawkins says, what does the universe have to say to us? Nothing. Nothing. The universe speaks to us, says Dawkins, a blind, pitiless indifference. Blind, pitiless indifference. It's all meaningless. There's no purpose to anything. All that's going on with illness is DNA perpetuating itself. I guess I have pretty duff DNA, and I hope you're all watching have great DNA, but ultimately, who cares, right? It's just DNA perpetuating itself. It doesn't really make any difference. Now, the Christian view is the exact opposite of that. The Christian view is of a loving Father God who made us, who we've rebelled against and who invites us to come back. And the first view has no hope whatsoever. It's an absolute dead end. And the second view has, has hope in, 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 in the cul-de-sac, if you like, of death, in the valley of the shadow of death. And suddenly a door opens and light comes through that. For the Christian, the door is, is, is a death into it, Death is the doorway into meeting God. But, and this is a really important but, that view is only of any use if it's true, right? Otherwise, it's just wishful thinking. And people sometimes say to me, you know, look, it's good for you because it helps you, right? But it only helps me if it's true. Otherwise, in the words of the famous book, it's a God delusion, right? So here's the question, friends. And this is the $64,000 question. On this, everything rises or falls. Did Jesus Christ really rise from the dead? When I say really, I mean physically, literally, not as an idea, as some misguided people think, or as a kind of inspiration. No, if you were there with a phone, could you have filmed what the eyewitness accounts say, that the stone was rolled away and Jesus came back from the dead? Well, the evidence I, I suggest to you is overwhelming that he did. I can't prove it 100%, but I can suggest it's very, very, very probable. Because Jesus was met by hundreds and hundreds of people over a long period of time, weeks and weeks. And he wasn't a ghost. He was um, he ate food. People could touch him. He met people in all kinds of different settings. And it wasn't just one or two people that we might think, you know, maybe they were smoking magic mushrooms or something. No, he was even seen by 500 people, 500 people at once. So Christianity stands or falls on that. Did Jesus really rise from the dead? And now that claim of 2000 years ago is the foundation stone of Christianity. And if it's true, then that means that we have a hope today because it means Jesus is alive today and it means we can know him today. Being a Christian is not about being religious or turning over a new leaf or doing one's best. It's about meeting the risen Jesus Christ and realizing that he is who he says he is. And that not only makes a difference for the past 2000 years ago, it makes a difference to me now and it can make a difference to you and it makes all the difference also in the future. The last verse of the 23rd Psalm is this. 
Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So where's the Christian going? Home, home across that bridge back to God. And that's God's invitation. God, the Bible says, doesn't want anyone to perish. By that, he means he doesn't want anyone to be eternally alienated, eternally rejected by him. It's a form of madness, friends, to reject God. It doesn't make sense. It really doesn't make sense. It's like the story, maybe some of you know, of the prodigal son. The prodigal son says to, says to his father, who in the story is God, I wish you were dead. And he goes a long way away and he, and he blows everything on wine, women and song. And then he ends up, which for a good Jewish boy is the worst place in the pigsty. And then the, the, the son says, oh, that's crazy. What am I doing here? I'm mad. This doesn't make any sense at all. I must come home. And he thinks I'm not worthy to be a son, but I could at least be a slave. But the story says, while he's a long way off, the father who remember is God, sees him and runs to him and throws his arm around him. And that's what God wants, right? God wants us to come home. God wants us to cross the bridge and the bridge is Christ and the death of Christ. And, and, and on the cross, Jesus offers us that way to come home. So just to finish, you know, an analogy that appeals to me is like a check, right? A check. God offers us a check. And the check is this eternal life. What do we mean by eternal life? We mean to be with God forever. We mean no more sadness, no more sorrow, no more, no, no more death itself. Death itself will be no more. The Bible says that God promises God himself will wipe away every tear. So heaven will be absolutely amazing, mind-blowingly brilliant, beyond our wildest understanding, because it's about being with God. And the choice is, do you want life or do you want death? Do you want separation from God? That's what Jesus says when he talks to a lady called Martha. He's, he's, he's standing grieving at the graveside of her brother who's about to be raised from the dead, but she doesn't know that. And she's like a lot of people now, like me sometimes. She, her head says, yeah, OK, but her heart says this is, this is terrible. And Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and I am the life. And that's what he says to you. That's his offer. That's the check, if you like. And how do we know that check is valid? Right. If you gave me a check, Nick, for 10,000 euros or a million, let's say a million euros, I'd be very grateful, but I might be a bit suspicious. Right. So how do we know the check won't bounce? Because God has signed the check. And how did he sign the check? By raising his son from the dead. Thank you so much, Jeremy. That, that, that is really helpful. There, there may well be questions on that. I haven't looked yet on, on Slido. You, you can make use of that. You can start asking the questions now. Um, I'm just going to put one more to, to, to Jeremy before, before that. The, the way you're speaking there, Jeremy, you have, you have so much uh, confidence. Um, and yet I do know from, from your books that you also have fears. And I think you've alluded to that earlier on in our conversation as well. What, what would you say to someone who fears death? And is it something you still fear or is this this confidence um, unshakable or just talk just talk a little bit how you'd encourage someone that fears dying um, uh, and and yourself, uh, your, your own views as well? Yeah, look, I'm, I'm afraid of dying, Nick, despite all the things I've said. Um, and it's perfectly human, I think, to, to fear death and, and grief is also very, very natural. There's a wonderful story in the Bible that comes to my mind. There's a grieving woman who's so sad and her eyes are full of tears because her son has just died. And she's leading the procession to bury him in an obscure town in Palestine 2000 years ago. And as she comes out of the town leading the funeral procession, there's a man standing in the way. And that man is Jesus Christ. And that man stands in her way and he stands in my way and he stands in your way. In fact, if you want to go to death without Jesus Christ, you've got to shove him out of the way because he stands in front of everybody and says, I am the way and I am the life. And more than that, he says at the end of the Bible, I have the keys of death and hell. I have the keys of death and hell. That's Jesus's claim. And that's our claim, not because of anything good about us, but because we know Jesus and we want to offer what he offers to everybody. Um, Eddie Izzard, the comedian, was interviewed in the um, in the newspaper and he said this. He said, all my life I've been traumatized by the death of my mother when I was seven or eight when when uh, when she had cancer. 
if only she or someone had come back through the clouds to tell us there's something there. That is the Christian claim. So it's quite natural to be afraid of death. I mean, you're crazy not to be, right? The reason we don't want to talk about death is because we're afraid of it, right? It's kind of obvious. It's the great taboo, right? The Victorians supposedly had a taboo about sex. We have a taboo about death. That's why we refer to it in euphemisms like passed away. Because we're, we're helpless, aren't we? And that's why the last year has been so terrifying. But Jesus Christ offers us the answer to death. Now, that's a really big claim, a big claim. Um, and what I'd encourage you if you're if you're watching is, you know, check it out. Right. If somebody offers you a vaccine, you might say, well, you know, who made it? What are the side effects? Is it does, will it work? That's the same thing about Christianity. Please look into it, because if there is an answer to death and if Jesus does hold the keys of death and hell and if he can validly say to you, I am the resurrection and I am the life, then there is an answer to death. But that then brings us to a choice. There were two men crucified, one each side of Jesus. They both saw the same things. And to start with, they were both the same. Both laughed at Jesus. Oh, that's laughable. You think you've got the answer to death? If you're the Messiah, save yourselves and others. But then one of them changed his mind. One of them changed his mind. That's what being a Christian is like. It's about changing a mind because he saw something. And what did he do? He said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He could see that Jesus, though dying, was a king, was a king. And Jesus said to him, truly, truly, which means, you know, in the old Bible, he used to say, verily, verily, like this is really important. Today you will be with me in paradise. And that's the promise for anybody who will trust in Jesus Christ, that today they will be with him in paradise. And did that dying thief know a lot? No. Could he ever go to church? No. Could he get baptized? No. All sorts of things he couldn't do, which we can do and are good things to do, by the way. But this he knew that Jesus was a king and that Jesus had the power over death. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, I, I'm going to go over to the questions now to see what's there. Um, hopefully you've been able to send them in via Slido or via text. And I'll have a look at my phone now in a second. I didn't want to do that while, while Jeremy was talking. Um, but let me just put this screen up here to say some of the ways Jeremy was talking about following up. Um, he's written these two books. He's actually sent them. He's a generous man. He's sent them to me uh, for free. Um, this is the big C. This is Jeremy's journey, um, his, his battle with cancer, the hope that he has in the face of cancer. Uh, if you'd like that, that's a great place to start. Do, do um, send a message, um, send an email to rectorofdrung at gmail.com, and I'll get that out to you in the post. Um, if you want to take things a bit further, if you're currently in the middle of suffering, this is a very helpful book, um, Hope in the Face of Suffering. This is 20 Daily Devotions for Tough Times. Uh, written by Jeremy, going through different parts of the Bible. Um, that's probably a, a better one if, you, if you'd already call yourself a Christian. Um, but both are very good. If you'd like both, you can write both in your email, but put a preference down for the first one and, and uh, they'll, they'll, we'll work out who gets what. But uh, that's number one, beyond the big C. And that's number two, hope in the face of suffering. Uh, do send your questions in to, to Slido. We'll have a look at those in a moment. Um, just to Another way you can follow up, uh, one of the blessings of this pandemic, church has gone online. It's so easy to join us. You can join us from wherever you are at the moment, just doing the same thing on YouTube, on Facebook, however it might be. Join your local church. Uh, you're welcome here tomorrow night at 8.30 for our Good Friday service and every Sunday at 11.15 a.m. for our live stream service. We run a course called Christianity Explored, another way to look into what Jeremy's been talking about. So do uh, make use of some of those things. And I'll see if I can find the questions now on, uh, on Slido, um, which should be over here somewhere. Um, or you can ask them in the comments. I'm also aware that my computer crashed in the middle of that. So whether I've lost the Slido page is another question. So um, do send them in. And while they're sending them in, I've got one here on the on the phone. Jeremy, how, how is it for your family? We've heard a lot about fr from from you. Um, how has it been for your um, your family in this time? I know in the book you talk about the the pain of talking to the family, uh, sharing that news. Yeah, no, look, it's really hard. 
um, that's probably the hardest thing about cancer is the effect it has on your on your family. Um, because it makes them sad, right? And you don't want to see people that you love sad. You know what you're going to tell them is, is going to make them sad, but you have to tell them the truth. Um, practically speaking, perhaps the biggest challenge, Nick, is the uncertainty. But again, that's sort of typical of what we've all been experiencing. So before COVID, I was always having to cancel holidays and change plans because something happened. And that makes it really difficult to, to plan. So no, cancer is like kind of dropping a bomb in the middle of your family. And um, it's really, it's really hard. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's, I'm just, I'm just I've seen a few questions come up here, Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, can I just see if I can share this? Um, this question here, how it ties into the family one, actually. How, how do you, as a Christian, grieve for what you've, what you've lost? Um, sorry, I thought I was talking about others you'd lost, but how do you as a Christian grieve for what you have lost? Yeah, you know, that's a really good question. Actually, I don't miss work at all. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, nobody on their deathbed says, I wish I'd spent more time in the office. And um, I never felt angry with God, but sometimes I do feel like, oh God, I just, you know, do you care about me? Especially sometimes it's happened, for example, when, I, when my eyes went in the middle of chemotherapy, you think, well, I'm dealing with one terrible thing and now you're kind of loading something else on top of it. And when that happens, my question to my mind is, well, is God really trustworthy? I think there are two questions in, in hard times and suffering. One is, does God exist at all? And two, if he exists, does he care about little old me? And my mind then gets cast back, Nick, to a fantastic story in the Bible, a true story, which, um, which has been very helpful to me. One day Jesus says to his disciples, let's go to the other side of the lake. And this is a very routine journey. This would be like in Seven Oaks, Nick saying, let's go to Tunbridge Wells, right? This is not an out of the way thing to do. They do this every day, they're fishermen, right? And um, in the middle of the lake, a tremendous storm blows up and the boat begins to sink and the disciples are terrified because they're about to drown. Meanwhile, where's Jesus? He's fast asleep, right? And sometimes the disciples fail you know, God is asleep. And sometimes I feel that. And what they do is they, in despair, eventually, very roughly, they, they doubt God and they say to Jesus, they shake him awake very rudely. And they say, don't you care? We're going to drown. What's going on? Do something about it. Right. A bit like the previous question. And that's how I feel sometimes. God, don't you care? I just can't. I can't put up with this anymore. And then Jesus wakes up and um, he with a word, he stills the storm. So in a, in, a, in a few seconds, it goes from a raging storm, water pouring in, the boat sinking to a mill pond, not a breath of wind, total calm. And then it says something very curious. It says, then they were even more afraid. Then the disciples were even more afraid. So they were more afraid in a mill pond calmness than in a raging storm. But why? Because it began to dawn on them who the ordinary looking person in their boat was that he was the son of God, because only God has the power to still the storm. So when I go through hard times in, in, in life or difficult things, and I have in the last few years a lot, then, then I think, well, is Christ in my boat? Yes, yes, he is. I believe he is in my boat. And therefore, he will bring me to the other side, the other side of the lake and the other side of life is to himself. And if you're a Christian and you're going through life hard to hard times, and Christ is in your boat, then he is faithful and he is trustworthy and he will bring you to the other side. And if he's not in your boat, you need to get him into your boat. Why? Because you're going to get a storm and the storm is death, right? Sorry, if you're feeling cheery this evening in Ireland, what's the death rate watching this, this call? 100%, right? We're all going to die. Hopefully we won't die of COVID, but we're all going to die of something. And Jesus Christ is the only way to beat death, the only way to defeat death, not, not just physical death, but as I said, eternal death, separation from God, alienation forever from God. And Christ actually wants to come into our boat. And he, he, he's very patient about that as well. The Bible says God is patient, not wanting any to perish, but everyone to come to faith in him. So, yeah, when I go through hard times, I think, what's God like? Is he trustworthy? And I think of that story, and I think, yes, he is trustworthy. Hmm. 
Thank you so much, Jeremy. That, that's very helpful, a very helpful image. I love that, that um, true story as well of the Lord Jesus getting into the, into the boat and calming that storm. We've got a few more questions come in here, both via the phone and on the, on, on the uh, Slido. Um, uh, a couple are related to each other. It, is it good to talk to someone about death and dying if they have a terminal diagnosis? Or is it better to keep positive? And a, a one that's similar to that is in what might be helpful in supporting someone with cancer. So can you just talk about that for a, for a minute? Yeah, look, I think, first of all, how should we deal with anyone who's suffering, whether it's someone with cancer or a victim of abuse or anything? We should listen to them, right? We should listen to them. And if they will allow us, um, which, which, which they may well do, we should get into their boat, which means to show empathy and kindness and humanity to them. But the danger is, especially sometimes for Christians, we get into the boat and then we want to grab the tiller, right? But it's not our boat. So how can we do that practically as Christians? I think, first of all, just to ask people questions, is, 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 uh, which allows them then to determine how, how much they want to talk about it. And a good question that, that I've talked to people about in that situation is, would you mind if I prayed for you? Would you mind if I prayed for you? By the way, of all the people in, in deep distress or facing death who I've said that to, no one has ever said, no, don't pray, pray for me. Because what have you got to lose, right? It's kind of common sense. Excuse me, my voice is a bit failing. But what have you got to lose? Because if there is no God, what difference does it make, right? And if there is a God and he can answer prayer, and I believe he can, then 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 that's amazing. That that makes all the difference. And the second question I would I, I typically ask people in, in that case is, um, would, would you mind if I read a psalm? A psalm. And the reason that, that the psalms are amazing is they're written 3,000 years ago. If you're not familiar with them, they're basically a form of poetry. And the people in the psalms are full of every emotion that we experience also in, in, in terrible illness and facing death, loneliness, anger, despair, grief and 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 <clears throat> god can cope with our emotions right so if we're feeling angry with god or if we feel anything about god talk to him right talk to him god invites anyone at any stage of their life to come to him and to talk to him think of that dying thief on the cross right jesus jesus responded to that man even though he was at his last his, his last breath of life so if you're at that stage or you know someone who's at the stage and the person wants to and we can't force them, yeah, just to say something like this, here's a good prayer. God, if you're there, show yourself to me. God, if you're there, show yourself to me. That's a great prayer for you if you're watching as well, as well as for someone who's in a terminal condition. Because the Bible promises, promises us this, that God does not play hide and seek. God promises in the Bible this. If you seek me with all your heart, you will surely find me. With all your heart, God means with all. If you genuinely seek me, you will find me. And Jesus is always intervening in people's lives, like the, the widow of Nain, the, the lady with the funeral procession I mentioned earlier. And he stands in front of us, and, and he can stand in front of people who are, who, who are in dire straits. And what's Jesus like, and what should we be like? When, when confronted with death, when confronted with near death, what's he like? He's full of kindness and compassion, and so should we be. And the Bible tells us that when Jesus saw this funeral procession, he was deeply moved. Literally, his intestines were twist, twisted. Where I grew up in Hertfordshire, we would say colloquially, Jesus was gutted. So God, the eternal God, is moved when he sees us in our suffering, when he sees us on our deathbed when he sees us in some grievous position. And we as Christians should be like that. We should be full of kindness and compassion. Thank you. I'm just, just aware of the time, Jeremy. Have you got time for two more? Is that oh, yeah, okay? I'm not, I'm, not, uh, I'm not going anywhere. I'm just sitting in my chair, Nick. That's fine, yeah. Keep them coming, please. The, 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 um, the beauty of my bad connection is I, I couldn't hear what you said, so I'm going to assume you said that that's okay, and I'll ask <laughs> yeah, them yeah. <laughs> if that's all right. Um, the, the, um, do, do stop me if, if it was a no, but um, on the phone here, are, are, there, are there times where you haven't been able to read the Bible? I mean, you've mentioned that there's times you lost your sight. Uh, are there things 
that you've found helpful when you haven't been able to read the Bible or are there other things that have helped you up, um, as well in this time? Yeah, the thing that's, yeah, that, have, that absolutely have been times when I couldn't read anything and there have also been mm. times when God seems very far away and, and you, you struggle. I just go back to this question, what's God like? Now, the infinite creator God who made the universe is, is in a sense unknowable, right? He's too big. But 2,000 years ago, God became a human being, and we can know what he's like because we have four eyewitness accounts. And when we go back and read those accounts, we find so many encouraging things. I'll give you an example. What, are, what am I often like and what are people maybe who are watching like? We're full of doubts, right? Aren't we? We're full of doubts, and we wonder about this and that. Being a Christian is not about eliminating all doubts. It's about meeting a person, and here's a story that proves it. Many of you will have heard of Thomas, right? Thomas was one of Jesus' disciples, but when Jesus rose from the dead, for whatever reason, he wasn't there. And when the other disciples told him, hey, Thomas, Jesus has risen from the dead, Thomas is highly sceptical, like a lot of people in England and I suspect in Ireland in 2021. He's thinking, no, dead people don't come back to life. And in fact, he goes further. He says, you must be joking. I will not believe this unless I can put my fingers into the nail holes in his palm and my hands into his side where a Roman soldier roughly thrust a spear to check he was dead. Otherwise, forget him. Now, you might think then, what would Jesus say to Thomas? And remember, Thomas has been with Jesus for three years. Would he say, Thomas, depart from me? You've had three years. Everybody else believes you don't. You're fired. You go go away from me. Go to hell. No, he doesn't say anything of the sort. He and, and God's the same with us. Thank God, and He's the same with me. When we wrestle with our doubts, what happens? Jesus appears, and he, he he's there in front of Thomas, and he says, "Very well, Thomas. Go ahead. Here are my holes. Put your hands in." And Thomas falls on the ground and says, "My Lord and my God." And then Jesus says something amazing. He said, look, Thomas, you're blessed because you have seen me. But much more blessed are those who haven't seen with their own eyes, but are still going to believe. And by that, he's talking about every Christian since the billions and billions of Christians who've come afterwards. So when I when I when I'm in that in that hole and I, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling yeah, what's going on, then I remember those. I remember those true stories. And I remember what's Jesus like. And has Jesus changed in 2000 years? Absolutely not. He's just the same Jesus as he now as he was 2000 years ago. And he's knowable to any person. And he's also meets us in our doubts. And that's what being a Christian is, friends. Being a Christian is two things, I suggest. One is realizing it's true, right? What I said before, that when you look at the evidence and look at it for yourself, please kick the tires, you realize yeah, actually, probably Jesus did rise from the dead. And then something else happens, which is we meet the risen Christ. And that's something transformational. That's what the Bible calls being born again. I know that has a terrible political meaning in America. Forget that. Being born again, being born is something fundamental and transformational. And why is it so transformational? Because God comes and lives in us. And that makes all the difference. So when we're a Christian, the Lord Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, comes and lives in our hearts and changes us and gives us hope. And that is available to anyone. What do you need to do to do that? Do you need to be religious? Do you need to do something? No. No, you just need to say, I'd like some of that. I'd like the hope. I'd like Jesus Christ. That's it. You just need to come with open hands. You need to do a U-turn. You need to realize I've been going away from God. And actually, that's that's mad. Like the prodigal son, I must I must come home. And the Father invites you home. And how do we get home? Through the Son, through his death and resurrection. Thank you, Jeremy. I think you've answered the other one that was that was down here as well, um, about your own doubts and what got you through, um, how you dealt with that. You also mentioned in the in the book um, <laughs> there were there were funny occasions, but how you'd how you'd memorize scripture um, and how it came to mind as you were having radiotherapy and things like that. Um, and how you related the the radiance so you would when you chuckling at one point and the doctor told you to stay still because you were laughing about something yeah, you that's right. remembered in the psalm oh, or something right. so yeah, it, it, there's too. a hiding of god yeah that's right go uh, nick 
C.S. Lewis said humour is God's way of um, making sense of a mad world. So that story is true. Yeah, I was having radiotherapy and because um, I was bored, I memorised the 34th Psalm. And yeah, one of the verses in it say, those who look to him are radiant. Right. So uh, as, I, as I was I thinking, I started laughing to myself. And yeah, the doctor said, you can't move because when you're doing radiotherapy, you've got to the, the kind of machine reads the tattoos on your body so yeah that's true yes. god ha god has a sense of humor if you like which is amazing which is also shows to me god's kindness and also when we look at the lord jesus we see we see his humanity and we, we see his sympathy we see his empathy and connection with us yes yeah here's a good one to end on jeremy what, what will you say to jesus when you meet him face to face thank you thank you yeah, because that's the Christian faith is a gift, friends. And here's the gift. The gift is while we were God's enemies, while we hated God. If we'd been there 2000 years ago, friends, we would have nailed Jesus to the cross because by nature, we don't want God in our life. I've got a friend who I have lots of interesting discussions with about Christian things. And he says to me, which I think is true of a lot of people, they just don't want to say, it. I don't want God in my life. I don't want someone telling me what to do. So. We would have nailed, we would have nailed Jesus to the cross had, had, had we been there. And that's that's the love that Christ had for us. That while we were his enemies, he came and he rescued us. He rescued us. That's what that's what Jesus' very name means. Jesus means savior, it means rescuer. So we can't we can't save ourselves. We can't pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. But standing in front of us is Jesus Christ, who says, I'm the resurrection, and I'm the life. Would you like some of that? Thank you so much, Jeremy. It, it's been wonderful to have this time with you. And I'm just sorry that I've cut in and out, but that's just the, the broad band here. But um, I hope that everyone has been able to hear what you've said. Do please send a message if you'd like one of Jeremy's books, and I'll get that in the post to you. Uh, remember, there's the two, uh, Beyond the Big Sea and the Hope uh, in Suffering. Do, do please get in, in contact with me if you'd like that or any anything you want to follow up with. You can send an email, you can send a, a, a comment, um, you can send me a message. Do do get in contact if you'd like either of those um, books. But um, I'm going to end the, end the broadcast there. And thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Um, and thank you, Jeremy, so much for giving of uh, your time this evening. Thank you. I'll end the broadcast there. <laughs>